our um, welcoming spirit on. Let's put a spirit of welcome in this place. And uh, it's things like this, events like this are so wonderful because um, the outreach is coming to us. The, the, the field is coming to us. And so we are ready uh, to receive them and welcome them here in this place. That begins at seven o'clock Friday evening. Now that I had you be seated, would you stand and maybe shake someone's hand around you? I know we've been crossing sections here for the last little bit, but maybe someone you just got to sit next to and uh, let's welcome them into the house of the Lord. Thank you so much. If you're online this evening, thank you so much for joining us here in this revival service this evening. We know that God is gonna do something great and mighty. There is a spirit of expectation just like there was this morning, and we believe that God is gonna do something in this place. Could we all lift our hands and let's invite the presence of God in this place. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you did this morning. God, we believe that you're gonna do a work in this place. God, we believe in your word tonight. God, and we believe that you can do something great, Lord. God, we thank you. Come on, can we lift our voices up to God tonight, Lord? We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, oh God, for what you did. God, we thank you for the souls that you fill with the Holy Ghost. God, and we believe, God, that you are just beginning. God, we know that you're continuing a great work that you started today. I wonder for 20 seconds, for 20 seconds, can we thank God for what he's going to do in this house tonight? Come on, tell me there's nothing like you, oh God. Lord, there's nothing like you. And that's why we give you total praise and total honor tonight. Clap your hands up to the Lord.
not the lyrics of a song but in your own words tell him what he means to you right here lord there's nothing that can compare to you jesus come on i hear you nothing can compare to you jesus you're a good good father you're a good 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 father oh and you're calling your children home you're calling your children home you may be seated worship with the choir song simply is entitled welcome home This may be a song that the captives can't yet sing But if we sing long enough, they might join in with us And this may be a dance that's too heavy for those chains But if we dance long enough, oh, the prince will open up
Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, lift up hands to heaven right here. Our praise is a weapon. Our praise is what goes before us in battle.
just love him in this place if you believe that your praise is truly your weapon to defeat the enemy oh my god this is how i find my best this is how i find my best this is how i find my battles come on somebody fight your battles with your praise right here oh this is how i find my best yeah this is how I find my battles. Oh, oh, this is how I find my battles. This is how I. Oh, oh. this is how I find my battles. up to heaven and with everything inside you to sing this with me. So good. 
bless this. I will bless. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless it, Lord. Come on, trendsetters. Come on, trendsetters, and lift up your voices and lead this song right here. Just one more time without any microphones. Come on, everybody sing. Uh, I Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. It's so beautiful in this place. The singing, the worship, the blessing of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence being here in such a beautiful way. Amen. I believe the healer is in the house. Do you believe that tonight? I believe the deliverer is in the house already. Amen. I believe for the last, for the last 32 minutes, we have prepared our hearts for the word. We're going to give an offering. That's worship. We're going to give an offering. That's worship. Amen. And then the man of God is going to come. And I'm so excited about Pastor Morgan coming and bringing the word of God in this house that night. Wasn't that awesome this morning? Wasn't that just an amazing word that blessed the church? I know it blessed me. Amen. I want to us just be making their way forward at this time. As we bring our tithe and our offering into the storehouse, let's do it with praise on our lips. Can we do that? Let's do it with praise on our lips. Let's pray over this offering. Father, I'm so grateful, Lord God, for this opportunity to give into your kingdom, Lord. It's an opportunity. Oh, God, I thank you for what Pastor presented this morning, Lord. Lord, there's a need for a training center, Lord God, right across, Lord, across our property, Lord. I, I'm just believing, Lord, your will is going to be done. 
Oh, I'm going to believe you're going to start speaking to hearts. I've already heard people that are going to bring offerings into this house, Lord, to support this great training center. Lord, God, I pray continue to touch hearts, continue to touch minds. And I'm just going to believe, Lord, God, that whatever needs to happen is going to happen. It's going to take place. And a miracle is going to come forth out of this training center. Lord, God, we praise you and worship you in this offering. In Jesus' name, everyone shout amen. Amen. Exit out the right side of your pew and back in on the left side. And we're going to sing one more song of worship. And then we're going to hear the word of God tonight.
Come on, if you believe that, would you stand to your feet? And would you give God a praise in this house? I believe that he's just getting started tonight. I don't know about you, but I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. Amen? I, I feel an expectation, have all day long, and I just believe the best is yet to come. Amen? Hopefully you were here this morning. You're ready to step up. Huh? I believe somebody's going to step up tonight. It might be a little uncomfortable, but before you leave here tonight, you're going to step up a little bit. I can't help uh, but just anticipate. I was privileged to drive down. There's a train about to run over me up here. I don't know what that sound is, but there's something happening up here. I don't know if you can hear it out there. I feel like singing the old song, Do You Hear What I Hear? The privilege to go down to Cleveland today and felt the same power of the Holy Ghost moving down there today in a great move of God. What a great crowd tonight, huh? It's so good to have every guest. It's good to have Brother Paul Macklin and his precious wife. Anybody who married Paul Macklin's got to be an angel on earth, amen? It's good to have Brother Paul Macklin. He is uh, one of the ministers after, out of uh, Pastor Sean Garnett's church. We've got the Cockendiles here, our missionaries to Ireland. Give them a big hand. It's good to have them here in the house of the Lord tonight and so many other guests. I'm just excited tonight to hear Brother uh, Pastor Mark Morgan minister the word of the Lord tonight. As Pastor asked me to introduce him tonight, I thought back, Brother Morgan, I don't know that you would even recall. Um, it was 2007 that I had plans to go to college and uh, to do some things after high school. And my dad went to Because of the Times in January of 2007 and he came back home and told me that my plans were changing and he said you're gonna go and you're gonna intern at the Pentecostals of Alexandria for four months and you'll figure out there whether or not what you want to do spring semester And so fall came I graduated in May and I went um, to beautiful Alexandria Louisiana for four months and I wasn't there very long and they announced that a man by the name of Brother Mark Morgan was coming in to minister to the church and he would be spending time with us interns there. And I cannot, I, I cannot even tell you the impact that you made on my life as an 18-year-old young man. In fact, you told me a principle about creation that every time I teach Search for Truth, I teach that principle. And I don't, I, I'll never forget that. I've watched him, like Pastor says, from a distance up into that point a mighty man of God and I, we're just so privileged here to have him from the other side of the country to come over and to be with us and I want you and I know we could applaud and and bring him because of who he is and what he's done but I wanted I think he would he would appreciate this tonight if we would lift our hands in expectation for what God is gonna do through this great man tonight would you lift both your hands tonight and welcome God's presence and the glory of God and Brother Mark Morgan tonight as he comes to minister the word. Come on, church, would you lift your voice up? God, we want you to do whatever you want to do in this house tonight. Praise God. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Anybody else sensing his strong presence and his glory in this place? Amen. Wow. Uh, what, what an honor to be here. I mean that. And, uh, well, y'all are proving a, a lot of people wrong here tonight. You know that? A lot of people say you can't get people to come to Sunday night church services. And uh, I don't know if this is, when I was a kid growing up, Sunday night was the service. Anybody remember what I'm talking about? <clears throat> Wednesday night was kind of boring Bible study. <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday school, and then a little morning worship. And uh, we had to put it in a box on Sunday morning because, like I said, we had to hurry up and get out because, you know, in Kennett, there wasn't that many steakhouses and restaurants, so everybody had to get there before everybody else. And so, but man, just wait. 
till Sunday night. That was our night. I was in the fifth grade, and uh, uh, my teacher's name was Mr. Black. And it was either the first or the second day he asked us to stand up and introduce ourselves. And then uh, where we lived, our parents' name, and where we went to church. Well, I mean, the first Sunday of my life, I was dedicated in an apostolic church. This is all I've known, all I want to know. And uh, so, but the deal is, is South School set on the South Bypass, and the Kennett Church was next to it. So you could look out the school window and see the church. And man, that church was crazy then. And so, <laughs> so they asked me, I stood and I said, my name's Mark Morgan. My parents, Herschel and Joyce Morgan, we live on Ares Street. And I go to the Church of Christ Church. And so, is that an angel coming toward me down that center aisle or? Somebody lost a little ball that had lights going off in it. So I thought, wow, man, this is going to be a great service here tonight. <laughs> and so, uh, so I stood up and I told him and I said, and I go to the Church of Christ Church. You know, I didn't want them to know I was one of them crazy Pentecostals. Now, back then, man, we weren't, you know, we were. We weren't as accepted then as we are now. And so, and the reason why I said Church of Christ is because Marvin Hicks was coming to Kennett to debate a Church of Christ guy. And, uh, and so it was fresh. We'd been announcing it. But back then they called the Church of Christ Camelites. So I asked my mom going home from church, so what's a Camelite? So she explains Church of Christ. So that was fresh in my mind. So that's the only thing I could think of. So I just said, Church of Christ, and I sat down, a little boy sitting next to me. He said, my name's Johnny Poole, and my daddy's the elder at the Church of Christ Church. I've never seen you there. <laughs> Be sure your sins will find you out fast. And so I kind of mumbled. He said, well, where do you go to church? Well, I'm going to go. And finally he said, you go to church over there? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, wow, can I go to church with you? No, no, we, we don't allow visitors anymore. <laughs> so we made a deal. I would go to church with him one time, he'd go to church with me. And so I said, well, you want to go? On Wednesday night, he said, no, we have to deal Wednesday night. You, you want to go Sunday? No, we have Sunday. Mm. This is not shaping up very good for me right now. So he agreed to come with me on Sunday night. I went with him on a Wednesday night. And all I know is I got there, and in my ignorance, I said, where's, where's the drums? Where's the music? And... Uh, I don't mean this disrespectful, but the best thing about it, it lasted about an hour. And so he come to church with me Sunday night. And I mean, I, I, I didn't pray back then, you know, I really didn't. And, uh, I, but I prayed that week, please God, let it be a, a really dead service. Let Brother Fowler, as our pastor at the time, let him preach on tithe and offering because it seems to lock up anytime somebody gets real quiet on those subjects. And so, so. Well, God answered my prayer for a while. And we had a lady in our church by the name of Peggy McMillan. And she started singing an old Don Johnson song. It's already paid for. And you know how we are in Pentecost. We can't just sing it one time and stop. We got to keep, you know, keep, keep going. And so she sang it through and it was still pretty sedate. And then she kind of got to, you know, and they kept going. And you, I was like, ooh, man, you know. Now, there were six kids in our family. We took up a whole pew. We really did. And at that time, there was uh, two sections of pews, and we were sitting about halfway over here. Yeah, about where Brother and Sister Bean are. Good to see you. And we were sitting there, and 
my dad was down on this end, the rest of us filled that in, and where Brother Bean would be sitting would be where Johnny was sitting that Sunday night, and I sat next to him. And I mean, she got to, she got to bouncing and just kind of singing, and I thought, oh, please, Jesus, just, man, stop singing. But she didn't. And remember I told you this morning about the guy come off the front pew at the Indian War Hoop? He did it. I mean, here he went, and he took off running around the church. He would get up in the air, and his feet would already be in motion. And he'd hit the ground moving. And uh, so he took off, did that, and then Sister Ope up on the second pew, she started her little spinning deal. And that was back in the days where bobby pins would start flying. I mean, back then, they'd get to shaking that hair. You didn't know what was going to come flying out of that hairdo they had. Oatmeal boxes. I don't... <laughs> Anybody remember what I'm talking about? Pile that hair up. I mean, it'd be like, and man, they, it, 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 it took off. I mean, Sister Opal spinning and doing all, and the tambourines come out and people got to, and I mean, now Brother Sanders comes, I can't really tell this. He come running around through there and he come flying by Johnny and Johnny knows me and said, what was that? <laughs> I don't know, you know, some of these old people, they get off their medicine, they do kind of cool. <laughs> Crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> and then Sister Opal's up there, woo, doing her deal. And then out of my peripheral, I see my dad's head start bobbing. And I thought, oh my God. It's going to hit right here on this pew. <laughs> and it did. And uh, man, it broke. It was just boom. <laughs> there's nothing like it. I'm just going to tell you, there's nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. When the people of God are expressing themselves and magnifying him, there's nothing like it. Amen. And, and so I, I, I got to feeling bad and I put my head down. Lord, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be ashamed of you. And I just didn't want people at school to find out and, then I thought I ought to check on Johnny. So I turned and looked at Johnny and I seen tears. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, we've scared this poor little fella to death. <laughs> and so I, I turned to him, I said, you okay? He said, yeah, I'll never forget it. I, I feel something. What do I feel? I said, well, it's the Holy Ghost. Never forget it. He said, what's the Holy Ghost? I mean, so I, in my feeble way, tried to explain it to him. And I said, you want the Holy Ghost? He said, yeah. So we walked down to the front. Now, you know, you'll remember when you went to the front, that, that, was, uh, that was fresh meat. Son, them old elders, they pounced on that boy. It was, it was less than 10 minutes. Johnny was laying flat on his back, talking in tongues, magnifying God. I like it. I like it when we feel, and they feel something. I felt something here tonight, and it's still here. Amen. Again, thank, thank you for the honor, and I mean that. I, I've been privileged and blessed to preach a lot of places. But uh, I, this was kind of like a highlight, and I, I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to stand here. Do I need to keep the mic up a little closer? Is that what it is? I'm the only preacher that they say put the mic up closer to your mouth. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, what, what a great place and wonderful people and I just felt connected today. My son called me and said, how did it go? I said, I just, I felt like I connected with them. And I said, that's the most important thing. I hope I don't disconnect tonight, but I felt like, and so brother, I don't know if it's pastor or bishop, but I, man, I, I like you. I like your family. I mean, I, I look forward to getting better acquainted. And, and uh, Jimmy Tony sent me a text a while ago and he said, he said, those are great people. And I said, yeah, I, I, I would agree. And so anyhow, thank you for letting us come. It's good to see everybody here. People started coming up here, sorry, started coming up here after service and connected and 
Wilsons and brought a lot of memories up. Amen. Okay, let's uh, let's 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 dive into it here. Uh, I want to read from First Kings chapter three, and <clears throat> man, I was I was telling the Lord, you know, you was good to me this morning. You spoke, and I knew exactly. But you're really going to have to speak up. And if you don't, then I hope we have a shouting service. And uh, I think he's given me some direction. I'm not here to just sermonize. I feel like God's given me something to say to you. Amen. First Kings chapter 3. And uh, let's start at verse 2. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. Everybody say those days. So I'm going to love the Lord walking in the statutes of David, his father. Only he sacrificed and burned incense in high places. Everybody say high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, Notice where the Lord appeared to him. It wasn't in Jerusalem. It was in Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. That's pretty strong right there. How would you like for God to give you a blank check? And he says, You fill it in. What would you ask for? This is exactly what happened to Solomon. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to talk to you about uh, the connection between the altar and the throne. And uh, if I had a subtitle, I, I would talk about lesser altars. Lesser altars. And I'll explain that to you here in just a second. Father, I'm thankful and grateful for the opportunity to stand here before this great host of people. I pray that you would quicken my mind and my spirit, give me clarity of thought. Let me say only what you want me to say, nothing more, nothing less. And I pray that you give authority in this service right now in the name of Jesus. I ask that you confirm your word and bear witness of it. We ask it in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. amen. Turn around somebody next to you, shake their hand while you're being seated and say, we're going somewhere. Praise God. Praise God. I said, we're going somewhere. You know, uh, I have, through COVID, I, I, and I, I'm just going to bump this. Through COVID, I uh, was kind of, okay, Lord, what are we supposed to do? How do we, what does post-COVID look like? I mean, man, COVID was the gift that just kept on giving you know, uh, we went one year in the state of California where we couldn't have church or in-house church. And uh, so uh, we had outhouse church, but not in-house church. <laughs> and and uh, so we were grateful that uh, a year ago, this past March or 2021, we were allowed back in our buildings to worship God, but it, it, it caused us to have to really look at all this and, you know, uh, what, what are we doing? What are you really trying to say to us? What are you really? So through all this, there were several things that I felt like the Lord personally dealt with me about, but one of the things that he strongly dealt with me about was, is my people had a great relationship with the church, but they didn't with me so much. And so <clears throat> when you can't have church, then it tests your relationship. And through all of that, we watched a lot of things happen, and we understand the culture of the church. And so I got to looking at it, and I felt very strong about uh, the, the saints have a ministry. What does the ministry of the saints look like? Uh, I, 
there's a lot of ideas and concepts and it means servitude and serving and so on and so forth. But what it took me back to was where Jesus gathered the 70 and the 12. And he commissions them and he tells them, he breaks them into groups of two and he says, I want you to go and I want you to preach. The kingdom is nigh or the kingdom is at hand, repent. And to the 70, he said, and when you get there, if I want you to proclaim my peace. And when you get there as a child of peace, when you get there, if there is a son of peace there, then my peace will remain. But if there's nobody there that wants peace, then you just wipe the dust off, pronounce judgment on it, and move on down the road. So I got to looking at that and I realized that uh, this is probably one of the first concepts of a different type ministry. But this is really kingdom ministry. And so I, I began to do a little study and uh, this is my interpretation of it. I, I looked at the verse where Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. And then the next verse he talks about the kingdom. So to me, I think that there is a difference between the church and the kingdom. I don't have time to go into the whole concept of kingdom, trust me, you, you just, we don't have enough time. We'd be here till next Sunday. And, and I've got a folder about that thick of notes and stuff written out and connecting and, and uh, I, I, I have unique notes uh, Brother Bean's seen some of them. I used to go into the office. We had this massive whiteboard, and God would get to giving me something, and I'd go there and start just writing and drawing on it. And uh, I use a lot of stick figures. <laughs> and so I got all these stick figures, and, and uh, then I got arrows pointing this way. And so uh, <clears throat> then my son-in-law, who helps me, would take a picture of it, and then it was his responsibility to pray for interpretation of notes <laughs> trying to make some kind of sense out of it and so I got to looking at it <clears throat> the best let, let me just put it to you like this uh, the kingdom ultimately derives in the masculine you know, it starts a little in the feminine but then it goes and you were talking about that that store God male female and all that but it derives into the masculine because when you say kingdom, it means king's domain. And so, but church is feminine. And so I look at it like you got a king and you got a queen. So the kingdom is about the king and the church is about the queen. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, if you disagree, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I, I, you just go ahead and be wrong. It doesn't bother me at all. And uh, so, you, you know, I, that's just kind of the way that I've seen it. Uh, you know, so what does the church look like? What does the kingdom look like? And uh, as I said, we are the church, so we have a better understanding of the feminine side of this and uh, the culture, what church is. But, you know, with any <clears throat> future relationship or relationship, you got to start to figure out the other side. And if you don't start figuring out the other side, you're in for a rocky marriage. I, I know every one of you got married and you've had nothing but peace your whole marriage and, and you just understood each other and you loved each other and, and you know, uh, but... You know, that I doubt that very seriously, amen. And some of you are still trying. You've been married for years, and you're still trying to figure each other out, amen. And uh, so I, I see it. So I see that we, I think, have a better understanding of, <clears throat> of um, church and a little less of kingdom. Now, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get too far. The, the, the deal is, is when you look at it, when Jesus is telling those 12 and 70, I want you to go and preach, repent for the kingdom is nigh. Now to the, uh, what was it, to the 12, he said, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. To the 70, he said, heal them. 
pronounce peace, preach peace, and heal people. Now they come back to him, the 70 come back rejoicing, saying, man, this is great. Uh, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. Now what you're seeing is, is you are seeing the power of the kingdom. If you'll remember, Jesus starts with the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, in earth, not on, in earth as it is in heaven. Now the only way for God's kingdom to manifest or to come is when the will of God is being done in the earth. It puts you in proper alignment with him. Does that make sense with anybody here? God's kingdom is not going to come when you're on the throne and you're doing it your way and it's about you and it's about your will. God's kingdom is not going to manifest. Your kingdom is going to manifest. But God's kingdom is not going to manifest. If you want God's kingdom into your life and he's truly going to be Lord, you've got to submit. The scripture does tell us, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee. There's no power in your resistance if you're not submitted. I hear people all the time, I've been rebuking the devil and he's not running. Okay, if that's the case, then go over and check the submission department. I, I, I got, I, I'm too old and too fat to get down here and cast out devils and take six hours to get it done and they're puking all over everything. And, and I'm, I believe in all that, I really do. I mean, I grew up, I've seen it, we still see it. So I just kind of learned a little something that I do. They're demon-possessed. A lot of people aren't demon-possessed. They just self-possessed. They just want attention. If they're truly demon-possessed, they're not just going to walk up and tell you, I'm possessed. And I've had them do that. Sometimes I lack a lot of compassion. I'm telling you right now. And I was preaching at a youth convention. We had three or 4,000 kids there. This girl was down there, and she'd get to screaming and all this, and the kids are down there you know, casting devils out of her. And so finally, finally, they come over and said, Brother Morgan, we need you to come over here and pray for this girl. We think she's got a devil and has just walked over there. And I said, okay, all right. So I walked over there and I said, uh, <clears throat> are, you, are you possessed? And, and she and growled at me and she said, yes, I'm possessed. <laughs> I said, no, you're not. She said, I'm possessed. I said, no, you're not. You're not possessed. I said, all you want is attention. Spirits want to hide. They don't want you to tell that they're there. That's the nature of your enemy. They want to hide. And so if they're boldly proclaiming that I'm possessed, I doubt very seriously. If they're truly possessed, the strong man that's in there is hiding. He doesn't want to have to leave. Now, I don't advise you doing this, but it was just kind of one of those moments that I just kind of went crazy. I said, now, you don't have a devil, but you want one so bad, I'm going to pray God will send you one. She said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Uh -uh, absolutely not. And, buddy, that was the last of her demon possession right there. But I have dealt with demonics, and I mean, I've, I've dealt with all kinds of crazy stuff. And so what I learned to do is just go get a Bible. When they start that stuff, I'll bring the Bible over to them, and I'll say, okay. Scripture says, submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil. This is the word of God. Yes, okay. Are you going to submit to all of it? If they say no, you're wasting my time. If they say yes, I ask them, I say, now, sincerely, are you willing to submit to everything that's in this book? Yes. Then it's only a matter of seconds because if you submit yourself, therefore, to God, you can resist the devil. And I'll tell them, okay, submit yourself. And now usually about that time right there is what, what's in, I, I don't know, it's more like I'm teaching something here right now. It's usually right there that what is hiding is going to manifest. Because it knows it's about to get expelled out of that house and it doesn't want to leave. And that's usually where they'll start speaking. And this one lady, she, this devil spoke out of her. And I got all kinds of names for devils. I, I, mostly they're stupid. I just say, I'm not talking to you, stupid. I've lost a whole bunch of you here, amen. I mean, I grew up in church, they cast devils out. <clears throat> I don't know where all the devils went. I guess they're hiding because we don't see a whole lot of it anymore. Oh, boy. 
I'll get back to my message. And so, so he said, cast it. Now, when he gets into the Lord's Prayer, he ends the Lord's Prayer with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So wherever God's kingdom is, you're going to witness his power and his glory. They go together. <clears throat> Uh, the devil takes Jesus to the top of the mountain, high place, shows him all the kingdoms and its glory, what they've seen, the wealth of it, the pomp of it. <clears throat> and so uh, this is what the kingdom, so God's kingdom has the same thing. It has power and it has glory. Power in that particular place is, uh, it's a dunamis, it's, it's explosive power. It's not authority, but it's explosive power. Kingdom represents authority. So the authority part's already covered with the term kingdom. But when you get to power, it's dealing with explosive power. And so Jesus was telling them, you are going to go and represent my kingdom. And when you get there, preach repent for the kingdom is at hand. Now again, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. So now we're seeing the kingdom in its advancement. And with its advancement, you are going to see now the power of the kingdom in operation. So they come back reporting. The power of the kingdom is exactly what you said. Even devils are subject to us through thy name. The Bible says that Jesus rejoiced. The Greek word there is agilio, which means to leap, to twirl, and to dance about. So Jesus got all excited about everything. So all of you that don't think Jesus ever danced and you don't think dancing's necessary and rejoicing in the church, I'll let you deal with that verse right there, amen. And all of you that want quiet church, I'll let you deal with the parable that Jesus gave about the prodigal and his elder brother. His elder brother said, I heard music and dancing coming from my daddy's house. And if there's any sound that ought to be coming from the father's house where there's reconciliation, there ought to be music and dancing and the sound of it that's coming from the father's house. <clears throat> Now, now, uh, here's the deal, okay, here's the deal. He says, don't rejoice because devils are subject to you. Rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Now, I, I, you can believe this different, but he didn't say your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He said it's written in heaven, meaning that in the kingdom of God, you are recognized. Your name is written in heaven. Now, there's that, and then there's your name being written in the Lamb's book of life. But what he's telling them is, is you are recognized in God's kingdom. You are a part of God's kingdom. You represent God's kingdom. So <clears throat> I got to looking at that and I kept thinking, okay, what's really going on with this whole thing? I mean, why did he divide them up by two? Then I found out that any time an approaching king or kingdom was advancing to take another city, another place, that they would send messengers before the king or the kingdom and they would go to that city and they would say, do you want us to come in peace or do you want us to come in war? You decide what you want. <clears throat> if you want us to come in peace, then uh, the peace will abide here. But if you don't, then trust me, that king that's coming <clears throat> is going to judge you and is going to pronounce punishment upon you. So this is about the advancing kingdom. Not the advancing church, but the advancing kingdom. The power of the kingdom is that we ought to be able to cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead. Because in God's kingdom, death, hell, and the grave, and sin and sickness has absolutely no jurisdiction. None. None. Absolutely none. And so it's about an advancing kingdom. It's about us taking this and advancing the kingdom. So this is what Jesus is teaching us. Now, I started looking at all this and said, okay, I'm starting to understand uh, that we are to take it out. Again, we understand the church. We're not talking about the church. This is right. But what we're talking about now is the kingdom. You are to be a, what, what's the word, a, a, a harbinger. And you are to be a herald. You are to be a messenger. Your message is to go out there into Maryville, Knoxville, wherever you live, and you are to go into that city as a messenger for the king. You're 
and you are to advance the kingdom. Find somebody that wants the peace of the king and when you find them, his peace will abide. If they don't want it, walk on down the street and find somebody else. Don't quit going to people. Just go down the road and find somebody else. I'm convinced that there's thousands of people in this area that are sons of peace and want God's peace in their life. It's a matter of us advancing God's kingdom to find them. And when you're advancing his kingdom, these signs shall follow them that believe. Are you with me? Kingdom. Well, every king, kingdom has a king, and king has a throne. So I started looking at all this, the throne, and what's well, about the throne. And, and, and so all of this is too much. This, this throne, okay, I see that there's a throne. The throne is where the will of the king is made manifest. It's the seat of his government. It's where his law is. It's where his will is. And so when we talk about the throne, now, I, I just want to throw this at you. This is a good study for you. Lucifer, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Lucifer's responsibility was to protect. He was to be a guardian of God's throne. He was placed, now this is me, he was placed in Eden. I think Ezekiel and Isaiah teaches us this. It's not just talking about the king of Tyre and Sidon and all those. It morphs from, is this too much? It, it, are, are y'all okay? I didn't eat anything after lunch, so I'm, I'm gonna get hungry here in a little bit, and so everything's gonna be okay, amen. And, and, and also, the deal is it morphs from, it morphs from um, a king and it kind of evolves. It's kind of like uh, Satan coming to people like he did Jesus, to men that had the potential of being the Messiah, the, the head crusher. He didn't know who he was going to be, so anybody that had potential, he'd come and offer them this. Just like Jesus, I'll give you all this glory, just bow and worship me. So he found people, I think, and those kings that were willing to take it. And so he gives them tremendous power. He gives them tremendous riches and glory. Then it morphs into being Lucifer. I think that Lucifer, it says, was in the garden. He was in Eden. I think he was placed there kind of like an outpost and that it's his responsibility to guard the will of God in Eden. It's your responsibility to guard the will of God in your life. I, I, I want to pause right there. It is your responsibility to guard the will of God in your life. Now, when Lucifer and a third of those angels decided that they didn't want to do it, and Lucifer exalts his will above the will of God, God said, that's it. You're no longer Lucifer. You're now Satan. The term Satan means adversary. Now, don't leave here saying that I called you Satan. I'm not calling you Satan. But I am going to tell every one of you, you have the potential of becoming a Satan. Ouch. You do. And don't feel bad. <laughs> Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, my Father which is in heaven. Six verses later. How many seconds do you think it took? Six verses later. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that are of God, but of man. What in the world caused Simon Peter to fall from bless to becoming Satan? Well, I feel something strong here right now. It's because Jesus said, I'm going to go die in Jerusalem. And Simon Peter opens his mouth and speaks against the will of God. So when you hear the will of God being expressed, you want to be very careful that you become a guardian of the will of God and not an adversary to the will of God. Now, I'm not here. They didn't pay me to say this, but I'm going to say it. Your bishop got up here this morning and said, this is what we feel like is the will of God. Don't let that carnal mind of yours cause you to open your mouth and to speak against the will of God and you become an adversary or a Satan to the things of God. Somebody help me here right now. 
Now, I know there's been a few times I've been Satan in my life. I've spoke against the will of God. I've, I've, I've asked God, I don't, I don't want to do that. Let, let me help you with something. You know, the hardest thing in your life is going to be for you to keep your will subdued and you submit it to the will of God. How in the world do I get to the throne of God? How do I get to where his will is expressed? I'm asked all over the country and the world, how do I know the will of God? I hear this a lot from young people. How do I know the will of God? I hear it from older people. How do I know the will of God? And then I also understand that in the apostolics, we have prophetic junkies. They go from conference to conference wanting somebody else to tell them what the will of God is. Let me give you some good advice. Would you like to hear it? Don't let somebody else find the will of God for you. You find it. I said, you find it. Mm. How do I get to the throne? Boy, I don't want to go too far here tonight. Jake is running in fear of his life. Man, wow. Jacob's running in fear of his life, and, and he comes, the Bible says, to a certain place. I think it's Genesis 28. He comes to a certain place. He lighted upon a certain place. He took stones of that place. Several, four or five times there, it talks about place. So the place is very important. What is the place? The place was called Luz. But what you have to understand, it is the, the first altar that his grandpa, at that time his name was Abram. When he comes into the land of Canaan, it's at Luz that he builds his first altar. It's there that God begins to establish with him covenants and his blessings upon him. It's there. Jacob had heard the stories, but he didn't know that it was a sacred place. So he goes flying in there, running from his brother, and he goes to sleep. And he wakes up the next day and said, man, I had a dream. I seen a ladder that came out of the heavens, and I seen angels ascending and descending upon that ladder. He said, hey, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place. He's not telling you that he was ignorant to the visitation. What he is telling you is, I didn't know that God dwelt in this place. He dwells here, not just in the heavens, he's here. That's why there's angels ascending and descending. Mm. This is none other but the house of God and it's the gate of heaven. Every congregation has to decide, are we going to be that kind of a church? Are we going to be a church where angels ascend and descend? Are we going to be a gateway church? Are we going to be the house of God? You've got to decide what throne is going to rule. I feel like preaching here just a little bit. There's two thrones in the scripture. There's a throne of righteousness and there's a throne of iniquity. He can't decide which throne is going to rule this church. That's a matter of the people deciding. When Moses starts presenting the things that God has spoken to him, three times he reads it and three times the people say, we will hearken and we will obey. When they said it the third time, the Bible says the heavens open and Moses and Aaron and Abihu and two or three others and 70 elders were allowed to appear into the heavens. They could see the throne of God. It's because the people had decided that they wanted to obey the word of God. They were establishing a throne of righteousness in the congregation, praise God. When a church decides to allow a throne of righteousness to rule over it, you get an open heaven. Oh, praise God, praise God. I said you get an open heaven. Every time the man of God gets up here and preaches to you the word of God, and people come up and shake your hand after or stand around saying, man, that was good preaching. I'm going to do it. What you don't understand is you are telling God, we want righteousness to rule here. But there's another throne. It's called the throne of iniquity. It's the throne of lawlessness. It's in the scripture. Lawlessness, iniquity is not just you getting rid of the law. It's you introducing your own law. And every time in the congregation, when you've got the majority of the people saying, we don't want to do that, we don't have to do that. I went home and Googled it, and I found out a way to go around it. Every time that happens, what congregations don't understand is they are decreeing to God, 
We don't want you to rule in this church. We want to rule in this church. We want to live by our own law. I feel like preaching here a second. We want to abide by our own law. I'm asking you a question here tonight. What throne do you want sitting right in the middle of this congregation? Do you want a throne of righteousness or do you want a throne of iniquity? If it's a throne of righteousness, then the people have to learn to say, Amen. 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 I'm going to be a doer of the word. Now, when you get that, whoo, when you get that, look out. It's an open heaven. There's no ceiling from the earth and there's no floor from the heaven. It's removed. It's direct. Churches that do that become gateway churches. Jesus looks at Nathaniel. I love this point right here. Jesus looks at Nathaniel and said, I seen you over in that tree. And Nathaniel said, wow, that's quite a word of knowledge. Jesus said, you think that's something from this day forward, you'll see the heavens open. And you'll see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus right there decreed you are presently looking at the house of God and the gate of heaven because I only do what my father tells me to do. I only say what my father tells me to say. Woo. It's an open heaven. Angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. That's the kind of church I want to pastor. That's the kind of people I want to fellowship with. It's people that the most important thing in their life is the will of God. Everybody still good? Yeah. All right, can I come back down here? Now, now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to the... the I'm, I'm radio on the tower asking them, when can I land? And he just said, circle the runway one more time. Now... How do I get to the throne? Here's the deal. That place that Jacob was at was the place of the altar. So I got to looking in the scripture and I found out something very amazing. When you see God's throne, look in close proximity because there's going to be an altar with it. And the only way to God's throne is you first got to go by the altar. I'm trying to get to the throne where God's will will be made known to me. I need the word of a king. Where the word of a king is, there's power. And who can say unto him, what doest thou? You don't question the king. When you get to the throne, here's another thing. Man's gift will make room for him, bring him for great people. That actually means you can't even get in the presence of a great person without bringing them a gift. So you can't get in the presence of God or this king without first bringing a gift. Well, what are you going to give him? He owns everything. Best thing you can give him is yourself. Right? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Don't let anybody ever tell you that holiness is unreasonable. It's unreasonable to people that don't want to live as a living sacrifice. They're alive to themselves. Now, that it is unreasonable then. I, I, I've done quite a study in these verses, and basically, this is kind of down y'all's alley. It means worship. This is true worship for you to live as, for you as a living sacrifice. I asked Dr. James Hughes one time, I said, what, what do you think that means? He said, well, you know, in the Old Testament, put a sacrifice on it, killed it, drained the blood. It didn't get off the altar. It stayed there. He said, but you and I, we can crawl on the altar today and die out, but tomorrow we can crawl off the altar. See, it's about a daily thing. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy 
will be done. See you therefore, brethren. And then the second verse says, don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And I say to a man that he should not think himself more highly than he ought to think. For God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Boy, you're a glutton for punishment, you know. <laughs> were you here this morning? What's that? You were lost? No, I was doing lots. <laughs> doing lots, right? Okay. I, I thought you said I was lost, so I'm, I'm glad you're found now. No, I'm messing with you. Let, let me let me let me show you something. Let me show you something. What really is success in the eyes of God? Now, with us, especially our North American culture, it's about advancement. It's about things. It's about more. But to God, it's about obedience. This is what God calls success. So if God calls you to go build a 10,000-member a congregation, he tells you to go do that, and he tells you to go over there and put your nose in that corner and don't move till he comes, which is more successful? We would say he's more successful, but in the eyes of God, he's just as successful as he is because both have done his will. That's why you're not to compare yourselves with each other. Because God has dealt to every man. Is this, is this okay? God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, that doesn't mean when you got the Holy Ghost, we all got this little faith. That means that God has spoke to you. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that means that God has spoke to you his will. That's the proportion of faith his will, what he's declared, what he's decreed. Can I, can I pick on you too? Which, which, you, you or you or you or you? Which, which ones? Are you married? Are you married? Are you married? Oh, I found out this morning. Okay. You married? My God, Brother Carpenter. <laughs> Ain't nobody married around here. I hope you're married. As close as you two are sitting and her arms all over you. <laughs> you come on. Man, I thought I was, man, we're going to have to open up a dating service around here or something. <laughs> okay, there you are. You're married. You're not, is that correct? Okay, come up here. I've used this analogy all over. I'll use it here. Okay. I'm going to be God. What's your name? Dalton. 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 Like Dalton. D A W S O N. D A L T O N. Forget it. <laughs> I'm going to call you D. What's your name? Nathaniel. Oh, I like that one. I, I can do that one. Okay. D. Dalton, Delson, whatever your name is. I'm going to be God. I want you to go to seven steps and stop. At seven? You sure? I want you to go three steps and stop. Now, I just set the perimeter of both of your faith as God. I told you this is the proportion of your faith. It's seven steps. I told you it's three. But you're not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Now, what was Paul saying there? Paul was saying for you to think that you know that there's four more steps yeah. and God didn't tell you to go, the moment you take that fourth step, you're doing it out of pride. You have now assumed the throne and the position of God. Okay, but here's the difference. See, he's not married and you are. What's your name? Elena? Man, I'm glad I got that one right. Amen. Elena, 
So you're a wonderful person, and you would never do this, okay? But you're married. And Elena says, what's wrong with you? You lack initiative. My mama must have been right about you. Huh. I mean, she's saying to you, she's putting pressure on you, and every man wants to be successful in the sight of his wife. So now, now you're battling with something called pride. And so she's saying, well, we know there's four more steps. And that, that's just not fair. I mean, you know, br Brother Carpenter used him, and, and he got to go seven steps, and you only got to go three. And that's not fair. Brother Carpenter, this is not fair. I want you to tell you that you didn't treat my husband right, and, and, and now you advanced him a lot further than you advanced him. And this is where people get m messed up right here. And so now there's pressure being, now you'd never do this, but there's pressure being put on you that you at least, look where he's at, you at least ought to get up there and maybe one step beyond him. Because yeah. after all, he's not even married. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you decide to take that fourth step. And God says, see ya. You're on your own now. You want to be God, then be God. Ooh, it's quiet in here right now. I, I want to help you a little further. You ready for this one? Living for God is like being a chess piece on a chess board. I learned this years ago, and I don't ever question it. Because in North America, we say every move should be forward. I've had people tell me I will never make a lateral move. Well, I didn't know that was my decision. I thought that was in God's department. As a chess piece, I can't move myself. And I hate to tell you, but on a chess board, not ever moves forward. There's some that are sideways, lateral, right? There's some that are even backwards. Okay, you two better sit down because this one's going to hurt everybody here tonight. Now, be nice to him. He's, he's eventually going to get there, so be nice to him. Amen. The deal is, is that's not all the moves there is on the chess board. God can sacrifice you for a bigger move. I felt the North American resistance. Resurrect John the Baptist and ask him. See, John thought he had it all figured out. Boy, this is going way further than I thought it was going to go. John th thought he had it all figured out, and he didn't. He thought when he said, I must decrease and he must increase, that meant he'll take the top position. I'll go down to second in command. And now he's in prison about to get his head cut off, and he says, I mean, the one proclaiming on the banks of Jordan, behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. And now he sends his messenger, says, go ask him, are you here or do we look for another? And Jesus said, you go tell John, lame walk, dumb talk, blind see, and blessed is he that's not offended in me. And one translation says, go tell John to let me run my business the way I want to run it. And we all need to learn to let God run his business the way he wants to run it, which means his will. Okay, 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 okay. All right, I got it. <coughs> Fuel's getting low. So how, how do I get there? I get there through the altar. Now, growing up in the church, I always, Bishop, associated the altar with prayer. And a few weeks ago, the Lord showed me and said, no, that's not true. You can pray, but not have an altar. What? The altar is a place of slaughter. It's death. Does this make sense? The, Jesus Christ, as far as I'm concerned, did not die on the cross. He died the night before in the garden when he said, nonetheless, not in my will, but thy will be done. Because the altar is where you take your will and put it on there and say, I'm getting rid of my will and I want your will and I want you to conform and I want, I want to do your will. When you get that, you have got to learn to be a guardian of that. 
Don't let anybody into your life that causes you to question the will of God or to talk you out of the will of God. I'm telling you, it's too hard to get to the throne sometimes and for God to finally speak to you to let some Pentecostal whatever come into your life and just start speaking. You don't have to do that. Listen to me. The most important thing in my life is that I please God. Not you, not an organization, but to please God. And the most important thing is for his kingdom to manifest through my life and the way that it manifests is through the altar. So when God speaks, I'm trying to, I'm trying to cover a lot of ground here and trying to help as much as I can. When God speaks to the man of God and he's in prayer and the spirit starts speaking, it's not him thinking this stuff up. That's God saying, this is what I want. This is where I want you to go. This is what I have for these people. And I want to encourage you, when you understand that, be a guardian of the gift. He's telling us what the will of God is. <clears throat> and I don't need to go to McDonald's after church tonight and sit down with some carnal saint and then tell me 99 reasons why we can't do what the man of God said we could do. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. You need to look at them and say, I ain't got time for this. I ain't got time for this. You, <laughs> well, I'm gonna stir up church trouble. You go and be a Satan. I'm not gonna be a Satan. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna do the will of God. And... Now, are y'all still okay? I'm, 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 I'm now getting down to my last major point in my text. I don't know, mid-90s, I was uh, privileged to preach. Somebody come up today and told me they was originally from Modesto or whatever. I was privileged to preach an extensive revival in Modesto for Brother Randy Keyes. And... Uh, I, uh, I, I, I preached that morning on the text, and my title was Lesser Altars, because here's the scenario. You got Gibeon, where is the great altar is. It's the great high place. But the Bible says even Solomon and the people went to these other high places, and one commentary called them Lesser Altars. These are altars of convenience. This is close to proximity to you. Just out your back door, a little high place. It don't even necessarily have to be a hill. Any altar was considered a high place. And so there's lesser altars, and then there's a great altar. And God tells Solomon, you've been at that lesser altar long enough. I want you to come to my altar. And Solomon went there. Now, we don't know if it was in one day he offered a 1,000 or it was consecutive trips. But we do know he offered a 1,000 burnt offerings. And when he was through at God's altar, not the altar that he built for God, but the altar God built for him. God says, I'm going to give you a blank check. And so, man. been here before I've been here several times congregations and churches I have I have where God was saying you've built some good altars and you've sacrificed but now I'm about to call you to my altar and this one's going to cost you this one's going to cost you See, we don't mind giving, we call it sacrificially, just kind of, oh, here it is, God, you know. That early church. Now, they didn't sell their homes. I've heard people say that. They sold, no, excess stuff. They, got, they sold it, they brought it 
to the feet of the apostles, laid it there. That early book of Acts church was sacrificing. And it was pure. It's undefiled. It's a true epitome of charity. This is what was going on. Yeah. Now, I preached that Sunday morning what I just told you. I preached about 25 minutes. The close of it, I heard a big thud behind me. And, and when, you, when you made a statement the other day about your house, it reminded me of this. You've got something great going on here. Don't, don't stop. God's going to call this church to greater sacrifice. But don't stop at these lesser altars. You go where God, and I've been in these other churches where they started it and then they backed away from it. Some of them have paid a tremendous price or they're not stepping up and going to the next dimension or, or whatever. I heard this thud behind me that morning, and I turned, and Brother Keys had fallen out of his chair. He's face first on the floor, sobbing and weeping. People began to flood toward the front. Church started at 6 o'clock that night. I got back to my motel. I left people still in the church. I got back to my motel a little after 4. The people were still in the altar. I got, <laughs> I got uh, to the room. I said, Lord, what do I preach tonight? I mean, what? you're not going to preach tonight. I'm going to show you what a true Book of Acts church service looked like. So I got back. I don't even know where some of these people did it, where they had the time. When I got back, the platform was stacked. With stuff, stuff, stuff. I'm not here preaching against stuff, but you just remember where the first king was found. He was hid among the stuff. And that's where God's North American church is hid right now. He's trying to get you to the kingdom, but we're hid with our stuff. Whew, I feel that anointing on me right stuff and they had brought their stuff that night and littered the altars with it guns as you know a few years ago california trust me golf clubs stuff one man walked up and gave an entire successful business that night and brother keys got up that night and said i own a retirement home and uh the lord told me today to give it they started bringing offerings and giving. Now, please, I'm not preaching this church that you're not a giving church. You wouldn't be where you're at if you were not a giving church. But the key to it is, is you built that altar, but now God says, I want to give you a blank check. I want this to be a gateway church where everything that I do in the earth moves through this place. I want this to be a place where angels ascend and descend. I want this to be my dwelling place. Heaven is my throne, but the earth is my footstool. And what connects the two is when there is an altar built on the earth, it opens the heavens to the throne. They kept giving checks. I'm not here taking offering. Checks, money, stuff. And I'm watching it all, and then all of a sudden it lifts. And when it lifted, it was that pure love of God. One of the men in the church, there was a lady there by the name of Bonnie Kettner, and she was the old prayer warrior of the church. She drove an old car. I mean, this car would break down. And she'd drive over to the church in Modesto every morning at 5 o'clock to pray. And uh, she was uh, Joy Haney and Priscilla Magruder and Mary Wilson on them as their aunt. She raised a lot of them, and she's a great woman of faith and prayer. And one of the men stood up in the church, and he said, Sister Bonnie, you've prayed for me and my family for years. I've heard you pray for us, and that old car of yours that's so 
broke down. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want you to ever have to come to the church like that again. This week, I'm going to take you down. I'm going to buy you a nice car. And it wasn't just what they were putting on the altar. It was what was happening between them. Because John was very clear when he said, if the true love of God manifests, hmm, if your brother has need, you don't shut up your bowels of compassion. See, you can't say, I agape you. Agape is a verb. It means you can only show it or express it. Oh, there was such a pure love of God, and I knew I'm standing in Acts chapter 4 right now. Now, let me, let me help you. Let me help you. And for some of you, no, he didn't put me up to this. And after the service today, no, he didn't ask me. This is what the Holy Ghost is saying. Don't become Ananias and Sapphira. You know why I got them in trouble? They pretended. It wasn't the amount. It was the pretense. People were given everything and they walked into that godly pure environment and they acted like they had given all. They would have lived to be old people if they had just walked in and said, we sold it for this much and here's half of it. But they walked into an arena where people were giving everything and they wanted to pretend that they were sacrificing like everybody else. And the North American church is going to stand in judgment with people whose life's blood run down the streets of their city. So don't step up and act like you're giving God everything when you know you're not. Because we're coming to the great altar. I have not preached this message. I'm closing. I have not preached this message in years since that time. That's the first time I preached it the last time. But in the last three weeks, I've preached this message in two places. I preached it at Harold Hoffman's in Detroit because the same spirit's on that church right there. Yes. And I'm preaching it here right now yes, yes. because I understand there's something that God is setting up right now in the earth. And he's looking for certain congregations that he says, you're going to become that gateway church. And you're going to be the church that I want you to be. But it's going to cost you this. And so then all of a sudden, guess what started happening in that service? Miracles. The Holy Ghost exploded. People were healed and delivered. I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle. That's what happens when a church says, we're going to come to the great altar. We want God's kingdom to manifest through us. What I'm talking about is a regional revival. It's a global revival. You're already involved in it. You're already a part of it. But God's going to ask you to step up now. I got something else for you. I got more for you. But if you're going to get to my throne, where I'm going to speak these things, you got to come by the altar. Don't just do something out of your own thinking, out of your own will. Get up from the altar. And when you get up from the altar, I'm going to give you a blank check. Whew. What would this church ask for tonight? If God handed your bishop a blank check and said, whatever you ask me for. I think I know him by now enough. He didn't ask for himself. He asked for the people. Read it, it's in there. He was asking for the people. Please give me wisdom to handle your people. Yes. And God said, because you didn't ask for yourself, but you asked for the people. I'm going to give you all that other stuff. Woo. And I feel a challenge in the Holy Ghost tonight. This is a great church, but God wants you to be greater. And if you're going to build God a great house, let me tell you something, and I feel strong right now. Apostolic training is fundamental. It has to be done. It has to be done. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We're letting universities and all these other things train our kids. They need to be trained with apostolic doctrine. They need to be trained with apostolic concepts. Whether by the Holy Ghost or just me, I charge you in the name of Jesus to move forward with the training of God's people that you can send them out. So you can send them out of there two by two going into the world to give you a true global impact. Let them go as messengers and harbingers of the kingdom 
but you'll teach them the kingdom concepts and precepts. Somebody rejoice in the Holy Ghost right now. Oh, don't stop. Rejoice in the Holy Ghost. Oh, let's keep doing it a while. Give him a sacrifice of praise. Not just praise, but a, a sacrifice of praise. This is what I normally do, but tonight I'm gonna do something greater. After all, he's great and he's greatly to be praised. Praise him according, according to his excellent greatness. If, if this is not your custom and you've been taught different, then honor it and let me know and I'll move. But I'm going to ask you to connect. I'm going to ask all through the congregation that you'll connect with people close to you. Because tonight we want to establish, we want God's throne. We want God's will in this church. And we're going to come together. And we're going to pray together right now in the Holy Ghost. Mm. We're going to signify to God as one people. The Tower of Babel, they could come together and God said, they got one language, one speech. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. I'm asking this church to join together and I'm asking you, standing right there, if you'll lift your voice and this church will come to the altar of the Lord tonight. If you will, the Bible says, submit yourself one to another. It's not about me exalting my will above you. It's about us finding the will of God. It's not about self-will in my throne. It's about God's throne. It's about God's will. I'm going to ask you to go further than you normally go. I'm going to ask you to pray a little further. After all, the Bible says that Jesus went a little further and the angels came and ministered to him. Go a little further than you normally go. Pray a little more fervent than you normally pray. Cry out to him more than you usually cry out. Go a little further. We want the heavens to open in this congregation. I decree tonight an open heaven over this church.
I think this is where you normally would go. I'm gonna ask you to push just a little bit more. I'm gonna ask you to lift your voice one more time. I'm gonna ask you to cry out one more time. I'm moving from the lesser altar. There you go. There you go. I'm moving from a lesser altar to a greater altar. But a greater altar is gonna build a greater house.
I want, I want Brother Morgan, I want Bishop Morgan to come back. I want B Bishop Morgan to come back to the pulpit for a moment. And I want him to start the story he told me today of his open heart surgery, what the surgeon told him, the dream he had about a bow, the dream he had about a bow. I want you to tell him. I had uh, come out of heart surgery and I was time of recovery and I thought it would be a, just one revelation after another, but two things God spoke to me and the one I'll go to here is, it was by dream and in the dream I seen myself on my knees. It would appear to be like outside in a church parking lot. And I started just arching back and it was becoming very uncomfortable and it was painful. And it was so real in the dream that I literally cried out. Of course, my wife thought, you know, oh Lord, something else is going wrong here. And, but in the dream, the Lord spoke to me and said, I will bend you like a bow for my use. Mm, Joe, brother and sister Bean were there when all that happened. And uh, I thought, man, it's pretty painful. <laughs> Resistance. And then a few days later, I said, Lord, a bow is useless without arrows. Yeah. And then he took me to that passage. Children are the heritage of the Lord. Happy is a man that has a quiver full. They are like arrows in the hands of a mighty man. And then he took me from that to the king and the prophet when the prophet overlaid the king's hand with that bow and arrow and said, shoot through that eastern window. And he did, and then he said, smite the ground. I don't believe he just took the arrows and hit the ground. I believe he smote it. He stuck the arrows in the ground. He only did it, what, four times? The prophet was wroth. You should have struck it more. I guess my question is, did he run out of arrows? deal is, is the Lord was showing me how we would take the entire Bay Area. It was so real and so literal, and I, I hope you don't mind, but Brother Bean bought me a, a bow and arrow. I've got it in my office. It hangs on the wall, several arrows. We call our, our leadership Team Arrow, training, training sons and daughters in the gospel to smite the earth with them and planting them into cities and communities that don't have an apostolic witness. Whew. This is the will of God. That's why the training is so important because they will become arrows, arrows in the hands of a mighty man. God has given you a mighty man and these are gonna be arrows. Arrows are vulnerable when they're in flight. They don't even know. They don't have any way to project themselves there. It takes a bow to project them. And this is exactly what's transpiring and happening in the spirit in this church. God has given you arrows, and this man is a bow. And he's going to project you to your destinies. And when you hit that place, you're going to have a great Holy Ghost impact. Amen. Let's just lift our hands right now. I told you this morning, God is up to something. God is up to something. God is up to something. Oh, God is up to something. God is up to something. God is up to something. Oh, God is up to something. God is up to something. Do you want to be a part of what God is up to? If you want to be a part of what God is up to, I want you to raise your hands right now. And I want you to pray with a sincere heart. Thy will be done, God. You know how many steps I can take. Oh, you know, God, how many steps I have in me, God. Oh, 
you know how many steps I have in me. You know how many steps I have in me, God. Now listen to your pastor for a moment. Just like he so beautifully used the two brothers tonight, you take seven steps, you take four steps. God has never required equal giving, but he has required equal sacrifice. We cannot all give equally because some of us only have four steps to sacrifice. A man that only has four set steps cannot go seven, but the man that has seven shouldn't just go four. I'm going to call on a spirit of sacrifice for giving that if this property the deal, if it comes through, that we will pay cash for this property beside us. I said we will pay cash for this property beside us. I said we will pay cash for this property beside us. We will pay cash. We will pay cash for this property beside us. It would be the ultimate will of God that we would take a cashier's check and that we would pay cash for this property beside us. But I will tell you, there will take a spirit of sacrifice that will have to fall upon this church. It will not be a lesser altar that will get that job done. It will not be a lesser altar. Is this making sense? It will not be a lesser altar. We will not take them a cashier's check if we have a lesser altar. If we give out of a convenience, and I'm not judging, I have had several offerings already today. I am not judging. Please do not believe that I am making a, a stab at you. God knows if that was your four steps or if that was your seven steps. God knows. But we will not do that if we have lesser altars. But do I have someone today that would be willing to follow me in that step that may put us off balance. Brother Carpenter, the economy. Brother Carpenter, all of this is going. Sounds like to me that it would be a perfect time to raise one leg, one foot. Yes, make ourselves vulnerable to the enemy, but you forget whose hands that we are in. We are not in the enemy's hands. The enemy can only come to those that want a lesser altar. But God will protect those that want a great altar. I have never asked you to sacrifice. I have never asked you to sacrifice that I, what I would not lead the way to sacrifice. He mentioned the house. Me and Sister Carpenter got married. My goal was by the time I turned 40, I'd have our home paid for. And I want you to know, I want you to know, yes, thank you, come sis. Yes, thank you, thank you. This is a very sacred moment right here. When I turned 40 years old, through sacrifice, we paid the last payment on our home when I was 40 years old. And I reached that goal. But then on the hill, Brother Cox, 
We started sitting on top of one another to get to, to have a place in church. The easiest thing in the world for a preacher to do is to say, I got a seat and I got a parking lot. I got a parking spot. And the easiest thing for a church to do is go through the attendance yo-yo. I'm going to tell you what would have happened up on the hill. We would have bounced back and forth between 400 and 200. And churches have done it for years because they're never willing to build a greater altar. But we were willing to build a greater altar. And I'm not pinning a rose on myself. But when this property became available, and it was six hundred something thousand dollars, and we had nowhere near the money to buy the property. My wife and I went and took a mortgage out on our home. We took a fifty thousand dollar mortgage out on our home, and we led we led the way. And I want to tell you tonight that I am sixty one, about to turn sixty two, and I have since that time never had a home. That was paid for. I'm not complaining. You hear me tonight. I'm not complaining. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I don't want to arrive at death. And have the only thing to say. Is his home was paid for. I'm going to lead the way tonight. I'm going to lead the way in a story. I'm 61. I do not want to retire. I have no plans to retire. I am going to preach and go till the day that I die or God renders me unable to go. But I do understand, Bishop Morgan, that I will have to design my schedule. If I'm going to be active at 80, I understand that that schedule will have to be changed. Again tonight, again tonight, I'm, I, I'm pinning no roses on me and Sister Carpenter. I just want you to know something. Tuesday night, I, this past Tuesday night, I preached in Sevierville. Wednesday night, I preached here in Maryville. Thursday night, I drove to store conference and preached Thursday night. Friday morning, I got up and I preached again at store conference. Didn't even, I didn't get to stay to hear Bishop Morgan. They took us to the airport, my wife and I. We flew from Nashville, Tennessee to Houston, Texas. I preached Friday night at See My City in Texas. I preached, sa I preached Saturday morning at See My City in Texas. Got on a plane, and I'm back here today. I understand, I understand, Brother Cox, I can't keep that schedule up. I understand that if I'm going to go the long run, I don't know about you, but I want to be around here when I'm 80. I want to be in the ministry when I'm 80. I want to be alive, but I understand. I understand that we have to find times of rest, times of getaway. We live over here on this street where the church is in sight, and quite honestly, we never feel like we're away from the church. And that's not, that's not a problem. But we never feel like that. My wife and I, Sister Carpenter, as always, wanted to have a little trailer spot somewhere up in the mountains where the creek comes down. And the Bible said, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart wasn't even for sale. The people wasn't even in the hands of a real estate. But an unbelievable deal came a couple of months ago. A little 2008 park model trailer on a lot right there. It's about 15 miles out of Gatlinburg. And a beautiful creek that runs down beside there. And I said, babe, we're going to buy that. We're going to buy that. They told us that morning... They told us that morning, we went up to talk to the owners. And they told us, they said, well, there's somebody else that's coming to make an offer on this property. And uh, heart sunk just a little bit. We got there at the property. They were asking 
They were asking $100,000 for that property. For the park model and the property that sets on the creek that runs by it. And uh, we went back behind the trailer. The man was there first that, had, that was making an offer. And Sister Carpenter said, we, we're not, we're not going to get this. We went behind the trailer and she said, we're not going to get this unless we offer them 5000 more than they're asking for it. And I, I'm just not used to dealing that way. I got news for you. I'm a low baller. But what I didn't know, the man that was before us, he was a low baller too. And he had already low balled them an offer. I stepped around behind that, beside that trailer and we told the two ladies, we said, uh, well, it went something like this. Sister Carpenter said, honey, tell them what we'll offer. And I guess my brain was so fried by her telling the 105, I forgot about it. I said, I looked at her and I said, you do it. She said, um, we'll give you 105000 for this trailer, the lot, beautiful creek. Two girls looked around and said, our dad owns it. He's in Florida, so let me call him right quick. They called their father, turned back around, said it's sold, said it's yours. About that time when she said it's yours, she looked at her phone. She said, uh-oh, the man that just left is making me another offer. And he made an offer way much higher, Sister Marin, than what we made. But these were two honorable ladies. And they said, no, they've made us this offer. And we're going to accept it. Now, I told you that whole story to tell you this. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to do it. But I am going to pledge. My wife and I have talked and prayed. We are going to pledge. I don't know how we may have to, we may have to get another mortgage, another mortgage. But we are going to pledge what we paid for our vacation home in Gatlinburg. We are going to pay, we're going to pledge $105,000 toward our property and toward our building over here. And I want to lead the way. And as your pastor, I'm going to tell you that Bishop Morgan is not a lesser altar. That is not a lesser altar for us. That is not a lesser altar. We will have to do some things. We'll either have to borrow it. Whatever we have to do. Whatever we have to do. But as your pastor. I want to ask you. And I know I've had time to think about this. You haven't. But I want to ask you tonight. Will you pray the will of God. For what he would have you to give. And would you pray God. I don't want it to be a lesser altar. Maybe I'm asking you to raise one financial foot up and maybe offset yourself financially a little bit. But this world needs arrows to fly into our cities. Do you want to be a part of it? Could we just pray right now? Could we, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to make a commitment tonight. I, I'm, I'm not asking you, God has been in this. God has been in this. I, I told Sister Carpenter at store conference, I said, don't say anything to Brother Morgan about this. If it's of God, God is going to lay it on his heart. If it's of God, I want you to begin to pray right now. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Oh, those of you that are watching, pray. Those of you that are here in the auditorium, I, I want you to pray right now. I want you to pray, but I want to speak to those that are watching online right now. I want to, I want to, I want to appeal to those of you that are watching online that, that you, would, you, would give a, you would give an offering of a great altar tonight, not an offering of a lesser altar, not, a, not, not an offering of convenience tonight. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, thy will be done, Lord. Lord, I feel like it was your will. You laid that amount in my mind. Oh, God, you laid that amount in my mind. God, we were willing to give $105,000. God, to find a place of rest. Lord, in the day, 
days in the weekdays. Lord, we gave $105,000 to have a place that we could rest, God. And Lord, we are giving tonight $105,000 that people can find the rest of the Holy Ghost and the right rest that comes of salvation. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Oh, precious God, precious God. Well, this is, if you'd stand with me all over the building, this is an unusual way to end the service tonight, is it not? Or is it the way that we're going to dismiss? Do we have one to baptize? Would you go get the person to baptize tonight? We had five receive the Holy Ghost this morning. <laughs> Sister Erickson, would you come? Brother Erickson, would you come and sing an appropriate song? But I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. It's an unusual way to end a message. But we've had an unusual man of God with us today. We have had a man of God that has reached deep into the treasure chest of God's Word and brought out things to us about the kingdom that has made us think about the kingdom. I'm not one to be an emotional giver. That's why tonight, that's why tonight, as your pastor, I want you to pray. But the only thing I want you to remember when you pray don't let it be a lesser altar. Don't let it be a lesser altar. Let it be an altar. Let it be an altar that you're not giving out of an abundance. You're giving sacrificially. You're giving sacrificially. Will you do that tonight? You're giving sacrificially. And when you reach that amount, when you reach that amount, I want you to to fill out a, a giving envelope. You may be able, when you reach that amount, you may be able. I personally tell you tonight, I cannot put what I have said in an envelope. I don't have it tonight. I don't have it. And in order to get it, I'll need to borrow it. I'll need to go, I'll need to go and borrow it. Somebody said, well, you know, I just don't know if that's right to borrow, to borrow, you, you know, I, you know. Can I just ask you this? Be true to your heart. Did you borrow to drive your car? Did you borrow for the car you have? Did you, did you borrow for the house you have? Because sometimes we put a different standard. Oh, I, I, I would never borrow. It, it wouldn't be God's will. Either I have it or I don't. You bought a car not that way. You live in a house that's not that way. And so tonight, all I'm asking you to do, all I'm asking you to do, is to pray and get the will of God. The wrong thing to do, the wrong thing to do is to go out to a restaurant tonight and start talking to people on your table, people that can take seven steps and you can take 12 steps. Let it be a very personal thing with you and your wife. Or as Brother Morgan has said, we've got several of you without a wife tonight, just by yourself. Will you do that tonight? Come on, while they're preparing for baptism, would you pray right now with me? Oh, God, speak, Lord. God, you have spoken. God, you have spoken. Yes, Lord, I receive, I receive that. I receive that interruption with what I just said. God, you have spoken. God, help us to hear you. God, help the people, Lord, to hear you tonight, Lord. Lord, let the people hear you tonight, God. Lord, I feel that if we hear you, God, the money will be there, Lord. The money will be there, God. If man doesn't get his hand in the way, the money will be there. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God. Let's linger in prayer and song as Brother Erickson leads us right now. I surrender. Everything I give to you, 
Josiah Selage, for the profession of your faith and obedience to the word of God, I do now indeed baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Hey, everybody.
of your faith in obedience to the word of God. I do now indeed baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And thank the Lord you just received the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. There you go. In the name of Jesus, I'm done. Yeah, hallelujah, Jesus.
Let's all just dismiss in prayer together as we raise our hands. God, we thank you, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, for the word that we heard in this place tonight. And we thank you, God, that we are a people that are privileged, Lord, to bring an offering, to build in the kingdom, to reach out of outside of these four walls around this world, Lord. God, we thank you for the privilege of embracing the truth. God, help us, God, as a body to take the full gospel to this whole world by giving, by working, by prayer, and by sacrifice. We thank you for it, for the privilege. In Jesus' name, you're, have a great week. And let's just be praying what God has for each one of us to give. God bless you.